can you explain a bit of the history of the Poor People's Campaign and uh, how and why you invoke the legacy of the civil rights movement in your work? Uh, how does your work build on or differ from the creative imaginations of freedom produced by past activists? So the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival was launched in 2018 in the spring. Um, we started on Mother's Day and went through um, June 23rd, um, and it was the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century, and folks organized in about 40 states um, at their state capitals, um, coming forward with a, a powerful agenda that the Poor People's Campaign has come up with. Um, and then from there, we um, uh, you know, kept on organizing, and folks established coordinating committees um, coordinated committees that are made up of, of impacted folks and of moral leaders and clergy and of activists and advocates um, uh, now in about 45 states, but we started off, uh, we started off wanting there to be um, campaigns in about 25 states and so many folks came forward that, um, uh, but that more launched. Um, and then um, we had a, a, poor, a first ever poor, poor, poor People's Moral Action Congress um, in 2019, and then, and there we we called for a poor people's mass assembly and moral march on Washington for for June of 2020. Um, and so, you know, the past you know really three years have been about um, you know shifting the narrative, the narrative on um, poverty and racism, ecological devastation, and militarism, and um, and then building power, building power among the 140 million people who are are poor and low income. So we launched in 2018. It was the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. King and the Welfare Rights Movement and Cesar Chavez, and actually there's a long history of a really diverse kind of coalition of folks that had actually come forward saying um, that uh, the Achilles heel of racism, militarism, and poverty was to unite poor people across racial and geographic lines into a powerful you know, what Dr. King called the intergenerational nonviolent army of the poor or a, a new freedom church of the poor. Um, uh, but, you know, so basically the idea was that, that to get at these triple evils of racism, poverty, and, and militarism um, that, that you needed to organize and unite um, and bring together, um, you know, a strong kind of coalition or movement um, of poor people uh, uh, across these differences and across especially the barriers that have been well set up in this society um, to keep uh, poor people down. Um, and so uh, we kind of said that you can't really honor um, a leader um, like Dr. King um, uh, without you know, basically reaching back into the work that he was doing, that others were doing. And um, and kind of committing, picking up the baton and, and committing to, to take it the next mile. Um, and uh, we actually had been wary and had been preparing for, for many years um, for that 50th anniversary. And, and we had seen a number of 50th anniversaries come up um, and, and pass um, where, uh, you know, um, there were important anniversaries of important, you know, historical work, um, you know, real sacrifice um, that had had that had gone to to change society. And and yet um, at the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, um, basically the Voting Rights Act was completely under attack um, and it had been completely gutted by the um, by the Shelby decision in the Supreme Court um, uh, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has this like, you know, powerful um, dissent statement where she says, you know, that basically gutting the Voting Rights Act is like, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, staying dry in a rainstorm because you have an umbrella and then, you know, telling folks to take the umbrella away. And so, um, so we had, we had watched a bunch of these anniversaries kind of come and go and, and we were a pretty diverse coalition of folks, you know, many folks that had actually been a part of, I mean, one of the things that's powerful about the work I come out of is, is many of the welfare rights leaders and homeless leaders that have been doing work um, had actually, you know, been a part of the Poor People's Campaign in 68, had been at Resurrection City in DC, had, had, um, had helped to been at, you know, 
some of our folks that are on our steering committee had been in this um, meeting of leaders a couple of weeks before Dr. King was assassinated, um, where he kind of says, you know, I haven't really been in a meeting like this before. Um, and so, um, so we had kind of watched these series of, of anniversaries come up and, 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 and again, it said like, well, you know, when Dr. King was killed, um, that even though a poor people's campaign and a resurrection city, you know, launched and there's some powerful learnings from it and great organizing that went into it, um, uh, because there, there, you know, a lot was assassinated with Dr. King, um, and that um, again, we needed to, you know, learn some of those lessons. Um, so, for instance, when we launched, you know. We weren't just doing DC. We were doing state capitals across the country. Um, when we launched, we we were, we weren't about having one or two leaders. We were about having, you know, thousands of leaders. Um, when we launched, you know, it wasn't with um, a, a demonstration that said that we're going to stay until we win, um, but instead followed kind of some of the the kind of um, steps of nonviolent civil disobedience where. Um, uh, you, like you, you don't where kind of we could regroup. We could say we're going to do this for 40 days, and then, um, and then we could change tactics. We could we could keep on building power. Um, and but there is a lot of 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 history and a lot of legacy um, that have gone in to to the Poor People's Campaign so far. Um, and we also have said that even if Dr. King, even if the welfare rights movement hadn't um, had a poor people's campaign, hadn't called for one in 67 and 68, we would still need one now. Um, we conducted this whole audit. Um, it was called Souls of Poor Folk. And, and we worked with the Economic Policy Institute and the Urban Institute and the Institute for Public Policy Studies and kind of looked at issues of racism and poverty and militarism and then also the environment. Um, and, and where things had were 50 years ago and where they were now. And so, you know, again, we have we have this kind of saying in our work that um, that we don't want to be loud and wrong. Um, and so we knew that pulling off, you know, a massive um, wave of civil disobedience and of, of action and 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 really bringing, you know, animating thousands of people to come into the struggle was going to be loud. Um, but we said we want to, you know, we want to have it based on um, real empirical data and real analysis and real scholarship. And and then we also, you know, uh, don't want to just curse the darkness, but we want to be able to be be kind of birthing you know, the policies, the legislation, the, the solutions to these problems. And so, um, so there was a lot of learning from, from the freedom struggles of the past. And then there was a lot of learning from the struggles that poor and homeless and other folks had been engaged in, you know, contemporarily. And it was kind of the pulling together of both of those to then form and launch the Poor People's Campaign.